It's always fun to be asked. Uh, I love coming every year. Um, and, and interestingly, this year, I didn't get asked to talk a, about one of my usual topics in colorectal surgery, like butt pus or rectal foreign bodies. Uh, but I did get to talk about something fun called toxic megacolon. Uh, it's very difficult, obviously, to talk about toxic megacolon in the you know eight to 10 minutes that I was given. So I'm going to really approach this from a practical standpoint um, for the acute care surgeon. And and because we could spend an hour talking about a lot of, you know, etiologies and, you know, nuances in management. And, but I'm going to try to make this a very practical talk. I have no disclosures. And I first want to talk to you about the etiology. And certainly, um, in fact, inflammatory bowel disease is at the top of the list. And of those uh, IBD uh, causes, ulcerative colitis much more common than Crohn's. When we get to infectious causes, Clostridium difficile or C. diff number one has to be on the top of your list there. There are a bunch of other uh, bacterial causes, including Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, all the usual suspects. There's parasitic causes, and there are also viral causes, and specifically cytomegalovirus. And if you come back, think, you know, we'll come back in just a few minutes talking about CMV for a second, because you have to be very concerned in uh, your HIV patients that present with toxic megacolon that the underlying cause could be CMV. There are some other odd and rare causes, including uh, Kaposi sarcoma. Clinically, it affects all ages and both sexes. It's, uh, it's an equal opportunity disease. Uh, and then as we have already talked about, patients with inflammatory bowel disease are at the highest risk for toxic megacolon. And it generally, interestingly, you'll find in these patients with IVD, it's usually in a very early presentation of the disease, meaning, especially in our population, this public safety net hospital, these patients have not been treated for ulcerative colitis before, they're presenting for their first time, and you're making the diagnosis, and they're presenting with toxic megacolon. So again, presenting early in the disease, not later after treatment. Bloody diarrhea is the most common uh, presenting symptom that we see along with malaise, abdominal pain, and distension. For the residents in the audience, history is very crucial. You wanna know if they have a history of IBD. You wanna know about recent travels, which may point to a bacterial cause. You wanna know about antibiotic use for C. diff, obviously. And then of course their immune status, whether they are in chemo, have been receiving chemotherapy, or if they are immunocompromised, such as the HIV patient, which may then lead you to one, uh, to think about one more, one etiology over another. To make the diagnosis, it's kind of threefold. You need a radiographic uh, evidence of, of, of colonic distension, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Plus, you need a couple of other things. You need fever, uh, an elevated heart rate, a leukocytosis, and anemia. The anemia, obviously, is coming from the bloody diarrhea. And then, you know, according you know, to the papers and the text, you need one of another following. Dehydration, altered sensorium, electrolyte dis uh, disturbances, or hypotension. And, and if you have those, usually you've got to be thinking about this uh, and, and being prepared uh, to get into surgery if necessary. So how do you continue that evaluation for the diagnosis, right? And so uh, we're going to talk about imaging first. So uh, obviously we use imaging to make the diagnosis of a toxic or a distended colon. Uh, the toxic part comes in obviously in the hemodynamics and other things that are happening with the patient. Now, just so you know, the radiologists use a, a diameter of six centimeters as, as defining something as that could, uh, and they usually say, cannot rule out toxic megacolon, clinical correlation is required, but they use six centimeters. We know as surgeons, we tend to use some other uh, measurements of the colon. Typically, you see that a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis is obtained first. And if you're lucky, not all the time in the emergency room, but if you're lucky, you may get oral and IV contrast. Usually, they're non-contrast, but a CT is usually done first. You then use serial plane films to follow uh, along and to use to, to track progression or regression of, of the colonic distension. Rarely are repeat CT scans used, um, more so because of the radiation, but it's much easier. Usually these patients are then admitted to the ICU and you can follow them much easier with a plain film. Now, as I talked in surgery, we tend to talk a little bit more about, you know, other di uh, diameters of distension, right? And so in the cecum, that will, is usually one of the more common uh, parts of the colon that'll get distended first. 
And, you know, we begin to worry when the cecum gets up about 10 centimeters. Dr. Byrne always told me, you know, your sphincter should be getting a little tight when it gets to 10 centimeters and you should be acting and not reacting. And so uh, in the transverse colon, we generally use an, a diameter of five to six centimeters. And, and, and usually, especially in IBD, it's pretty rare for the sigmoid uh, or, the descend or the rectum to dilate. Here's some uh, classic examples of film. The film, the plain film I'm showing you is from a patient when I was a fellow. This is actually when we still had uh, plain films. Peter, you probably remember when we used to have those at the old county, we had plain films. Uh, and uh, that's one of my patients when I was a fellow. Uh, and this was a patient that had toxic megacolon from ulcerative colitis. Very typical, we see that you know, very grossly distended uh, transverse colon. On the left side where all the arrows are, you notice that the left colon isn't distended, but if you notice the colonic mucosal pattern is gone, and that's very typical in ulcerative colitis patients that get that typical lead pipe appearance. And there is a transverse arrow in the transverse colon. If you can see it, it's maybe hard to see from the audience, but you can tell this is an old film because there's a greenfield filter there. <laughs> We also use CT scan, and obviously in today's world, and uh, you measure right on the CT scan, use rulers, you can track things. Uh, and I always encourage the residents not only to look at the axial views, but also look at the coronals and sagittals. They can give you a lot of information and gave, get, may give you more information than you realize. Again, along with the imaging, we look at lab studies. Some of them may be nonspecific, but can garner important information for you. We, can't, we will always generally see a leukocytosis with a left shift in these patients that have toxic megacolon. And obviously, as the residents know, beware if the white count begins to plummet. That generally means you're behind the eight ball and you need to be acting and not reacting. Uh, generally, that means the patient's heading into some very significant sepsis. We often see electrolyte disturbances, hypoalbuminemia can occur in about 75% of these patients. Non-specific texts like said rate and C-reactive protein are usually increased. You should always send stool specimens for culture and microscopic analysis and C. diff, no matter what you believe the cause is, just to make sure you don't have an underlying super infection. And just a word for the wise, there is no role for endoscopy in toxic megacolon, right? You do not want to be insufflating the colon at all. Uh, and so we do not use endoscopy. When we talk about treatment, the main goal is to reduce the severity of the colitis and to restore normal colonic motility so that you begin to move the contents of the colon uh, through. Uh, and you want to decrease your likelihood of perforation. The initial therapy is mostly supportive, but about 50% will continue, will move on or proceed to surgery. Surgery, in my opinion, should be intimately involved in the managing of these patients because there is some very you know, important decision-making that has to happen, which I'll talk about in just a second. But if the surgeon isn't involved and gets involved after the fact, usually it's too late. Again, that keen clinical eye that I talked about, while the principal objective of medical therapy is to circumvent the need for surgery, unfortunately, delaying surgery can be fatal. Now, you kind of focus your treatment on their underlying cause. If it's inflammatory bowel disease related, you generally start with IV steroids as first line therapy, usually hydrocortisone, 100 milligrams every two to six to eight. Um, unfortunately, our GI colleagues, and I mean those, no disrespect, but if the steroids aren't working, they often want to add Remicade on board and they want to delay you going to surgery. Well, let's try Remicade or let's try another tumor, a TNF blocking agent. And usually by the time they're doing that, you're behind and you really should be in the operating room getting the colon out. Um, obviously, you, in all, no matter what the cause, you want to continue to monitor these patients in, a, in an ICU setting every, uh, with labs, every eight to 12 hours, along with imaging to ensure that you're not missing uh, worsening of disease. In C. diff, obviously, again, you know, the medical therapies are first line and HIV patients, as I mentioned, think CMV. Now, as I said, the key point is making the decision to get to go to surgery. Clearly, if you have a perforation, you need to be in the operating room. There's no question. There are some absolutes. Perforation, massive hemorrhage, increasing uh, transfusion requirements, progression of the distension are absolute indications at any time. The challenge is oftentimes they don't come in with a perforation and you have to make the decision of when to go to surgery. And you've got to just monitor all those things. And if you're getting a worsening clinical situation, whether it's on vitals or labs, or by the imaging, you need to be in the operating room. From the colorectal surgeon, that's my message. Don't get behind, right? Because once you get behind, and I'm not meeting the backside, but once you get behind, uh, 
outcomes, you're, you're in trouble. Your outcomes are approved if you're in the operating room before the colonic perforation happens. Once the colonic perforation happens, the outcomes become much worse. And if you get in before the uh, perforation, you still have about an 8% mortality, but once the perforation happens, the mortality in these patients rises to over 40%. The operation that you should be performing is a total abdominal colectomy with endiliosomy. It's your procedure of choice. There is no role for segmental or partial colectomies. This is from about five years ago, a patient that I did at the county. This patient had C. diff, and as you can see, that's a pretty big colon, and it's a total abdominal colectomy on the table. Again, um, with time running out, just in conclusion, uh, a toxic megacolon can be from a variety of causes, but IBD and C. diff need to be high on your list. It is always appropriate unless there is uh, evidence of peritonitis that you can attempt an initial uh, treatment at medical therapy, but you must have a low threshold and the involvement of surgery is vital here. Your goal is to be in the operating room before that abdominal catastrophe happens and your operation of choice is a total abdominal colectomy with endiliosomy to get you through the acute phase. So again, I always appreciate being here, Dr. D, and as I uh, appreciate your guidance and mentorship over these many years and uh, thank you for the pleasure of uh, the podium.